The criminal court of the 10th district is now in session. The Honorable Suzanne Gantry presiding. Let all who have matters come forth. May God bless this court. Please be seated. Well, we certainly have a lot of interest today. Thank you for your presence. The matter at hand is the case of the state versus Mr. Peter Duffy. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Defense ready to proceed. We are ready, Your Honor. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you were selected last week, and when you left here, I gave you specific instructions not to discuss this case with anyone. I warned you that if anyone tried to approach you to discuss with this case, you were to notify me. I now ask if that has happened. Have you had any contact with anyone about this case? No. no. Good, we are now ready to begin. Both sides have the opportunity to address you directly and to make what we refer to as opening statements. An opening statement is not proof, not evidence, just a summary of each side's version of what happened. Since the state has the burden of proving guilt, the state will always go first. Mr. Hogan, are you ready? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Hogan, and I'm the district attorney. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the photograph of the victim, Mara Duffy. She was only 46 years old when she was brutally murdered. She was a mother of two sons from a previous marriage. Her body was found in the living room of the home she shared with her husband, Mr. Peter Duffy. When her body was found, the front door of their home was unlocked, slightly open. The alarm system was on standby mode. Someone had taken her jewelry, a set of antique watches owned by Mr. Peter Duffy, and three handguns from a drawer in the den. On the day she was murdered, Mrs. Duffy had a lunch date at noon with her sister. Apparently, she was ready to leave the house when she was attacked and killed. The murderer went through the house, took the items that are now missing, and left. Ladies and gentlemen, you learned that at the day of the wife's murder, Mrs. Duffy's sister became so concerned, she began calling her ten times over the next two hours, and became so concerned, she drove to her home, and to her horror, found her dead. At first, Myra's sister thought she had died of a heart attack, or other natural cause. But given her age, fitness, and no history of drug abuse, the sister became suspicious. The autopsy revealed the true cause of Mara's death. The cowardly person who killed Mrs. Duffy grabbed her from the back and pressed her firmly on the neck. Once she passed out, the murderer kept pressing and 60 seconds later, she was dead. The most qualified expert witnesses will tell you that there were no signs of trouble, no broken fingernails, no scratches, nothing, why? Because she knew the man who killed her. She knew him because she was married with him. She was able to get so close to her because she trusted him. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, with heavy security, the guarded house, it's highly unlikely for an intruder to come into Duffy's home unnoticed. Unless, unless the intruder was not actually an intruder because he lived there too. Then over the next few days, as witnesses are on stand, you will learn that none of the neighbors saw a strange vehicle leaving the house. No one saw a stranger walking down the street or running from the house. Nothing unusual was reported. Ladies and gentlemen, you will also learn that at the day of his wife's murder, Mr. Duffy was playing golf. He teed off at 11.10 a.m. The day was overcast, cool, and windy. The kind of weather that will discourage most people from playing golf. There were no one else in any of the three courses in 11, 10 a.m. When the sister, when Myra's sister found her, she immediately called 911 and the autopsy revealed her time of death at around 11.45. Ladies and gentlemen, you will also learn from the tests performed by prosecution that Mr. Duffy was on the fourth or fifth hole of the North Nine at the time of his wife's murder. Mr. Duffy could travel from this part of the course to his home in about eight minutes. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, during the next few weeks, the state will prove to you that Mr. Duffy both had the opportunity and the motives to kill his wife. As far as the opportunity goes, Peter Duffy knew that his wife was home. He obviously had access to his own house, and he was in a golf cart only minutes away from his wife's murder. Why, you may ask, would Peter Duffy kill his wife? What was his motive? The answer was money, ladies and gentlemen, money. This is a life insurance policy purchased by Mr. Peter Duffy two years ago, insuring his late wife, <coughs> Myra Duffy. Yes, the state will convince to you that Mr. Duffy murdered his wife to get money. As a real estate developer, he had lost big. And at the time of his wife's murder, he was getting squeezed by the bank. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Duffy was on verge of going broke. He needed cash. He needed money. He needed his wife's life insurance money. This was a cold-blooded murder, ladies and gentlemen. Perfectly planned and carefully executed. No witnesses left behind. Nothing. I did not murder my wife. Ms. Dennis, please control your client. Ladies and gentlemen, during this trial, you will learn and hopefully come to only possible and reasonable conclusion that Mr. Duffy willfully and maliciously murdered his wife. He planned for so long, he knew just what to do. Grab his wife's expensive jewelry, grab the expensive watches, and grab the handguns so police will think it is a job of a burglar. Seconds later, he was out of the door, back in the golf cart to finish his lonely game of golf. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence and the witnesses the state will present you will make your decision an easy one. We are confident that you will do your duty, which is to just right and just to prove Mr. Peter Duffy guilty of the first degree murder of his wife. Let us take a 10 minute recess. All right. Ms. Dennis, is the defense ready? Yes, your honor. You may proceed. Not a shred of evidence. Nothing, no witnesses, no crime scene proof. Nothing but this clean, neat, tidy little story Mr. Hogan just shared with you, not one word of which is evidence. Just this fanciful version of what maybe could have happened. Maybe Peter Duffy had to kill his wife. Maybe he carefully planned it all. Mr. Hogan is asking you, ladies and gentlemen, to play the maybe game. Maybe this happened, maybe that happened. And he wants you to play along because he has no proof. He has nothing, nothing but a man playing golf alone, minding his own business while his wife gets murdered in their lovely home less than a mile away. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't blame Mr. Hogan for playing the maybe game. He really has no choice, and this is because he has no evidence. He has nothing but a vivid, overactive imagination. Order! Order in the court! Our constitution, our laws, our rules of procedure, they're built on the ideas of fairness. And guess what? There's absolutely no room for a bunch of maybes. Our laws are clear. Judge Gantry will explain them later, and when she does, please listen carefully. You will not hear her utter the word maybe a single time. What you will hear is the well-known and time-honored and old-fashioned American rule that says that when the state accuses you of a crime, the state must walk in here with all of its resources, investigators, police, experts, prosecutors, crime scene analysts, all of these smart and experienced people and to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did, in fact, commit the crime. Beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, the state has a heavy burden, one that it cannot possibly meet. Now, the law says that Pete Duffy does not have to testify, does not have to call witnesses in his defense, does not have to prove anything. And why is this? Well, it is very simple. He's protected by one of our most cherished safeguards. It is called the presumption of innocence. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Pete Duffy sits here an innocent man, same as you, same as me. However, Pete Duffy will testify. 
He wants to testify. He cannot wait to testify. And when he takes a seat right here on the witness stand, he will testify under oath and he will tell you the truth. The truth, ladies and gentlemen, was that Pete Duffy was indeed playing golf that fateful day. He was alone. The truth, ladies and gentlemen, is something far different from the little story Mr. Hogan just concocted. The truth, ladies and gentlemen, was that Pete Duffy was indeed playing golf that fateful day and he was alone. He was on the course, alone, while his wife was at home getting ready to leave for lunch in town. A thief, some unknown criminal, who is alert and will probably, probably remain at the rate we are going, entered the house quietly, mistakenly down, no one's home. The alarm was off. The front door was unlocked, as was the back door. This was not, and still not, uncommon in this neighborhood. Unexpectedly, the thief encountered Myra Duffy, attacked her with his hands because he had no weapon, and at that point, he became something else. He became a murderer. And he's still out there, or he could be here. Since we're playing the maybe game, then maybe he's here watching this trial. Why not? He's certainly safe from Mr. Hogan and his gang. Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hogan also told you about the insurance policy that Pete Duffy took out on his wife's life, making himself a recipient of a million dollars the event his wife died. But what Mr. Hogan did not tell you was that there had been an identical policy on Pete Duffy's life, naming Mrs. Duffy as the recipient. Pete and Myra Duffy had simply done what most married couples do. They purchased dual policies. Contrary to what Mr. Hogan said, there was nothing sinister about the insurance policy that Pete Duffy took out on his wife's life. Ladies and gentlemen, you will come to realize early in this trial that the state has no case against Pete Duffy. They have no motive and no evidence, and this is because Pete Duffy is innocent of the crime of murder of which he has been accused. We, the defense, sincerely hope that you will consider everything that is brought before you in this trial and that if you have any reasonable doubts, you will render the only possible and only fair verdict of not guilty. Let us break for an early lunch. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, remember my warnings. Do not discuss any of the aspects of this trial with anyone. The trial will resume at 1.30. All rise!